Yeah, they have a, a, a sandcastle festival there. They park people on the beach. So when the tide's out, I'm just so they park people way out here. Yeah, just take a look at the tide's coming back in. Yeah. So every year they do something like 80 that leaves their car out there. Yeah. It's up in on their yeah. 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 Ye
So email me if there's any questions that come up. It's been fairly smooth thus far, so let I me mean, know if something comes up. But again, the keyword today is uh, epinephrine. said at one point you were the oldest person in the room. Actually, that's not true. We always reserve that honor for Nick, <laughs> no matter what the circumstances. <laughs> but anyway, Mike's put together a, a very nice presentation here on anaphylaxis, causes, diagnosis, and treatment, and then Matt will present a case uh, to follow. So, Mike, thank you. Are they dinner? No. It's all or nothing. It's all or nothing. Hi, guys. <laughs> so, um, anaphylaxis uh, has been a topic uh, that has um, been around for a long time. And I was, when I started putting the slide deck together, I, I wanted to update it, and I found a lot of stuff that you're going to find of interest, a lot of new things. Um, and that's uh, organized, I'll take you through it. Um, definition, anaphylaxis is a serious systemic allergic reaction, rapid and onset, may cause death. Generally agreed upon anaphyla uh, uh, definition of anaphylaxis. Um, the incidence is uh, uh, unclear. There are a lot of ways to um, estimate the incidence, but I think that the uh, overall incidence is about one per 1,000 people per year uh, for anaphylaxis. And so that, the top of the part of the slide goes through some of the data that, that goes into that estimate. Um, nobody has really hard data on that. That's still, when you think about uh, all, how many people are in this area or in the country, that is a lot of anaphylaxis. Um, we get to see some of it, ours just get to see some of it, um, both in our offices and referred to us after emergency room visits. But it's amazing how many people get to the ER and then are lost to follow up and don't get referred properly. And so that's one of the real uh, deficiencies we have, deficiencies we have uh, in anaphylaxis. Um, all right, so. I can't actually see the slide. <laughs> oh, I got it. It's hard. It's hard to see the down button there. Um, so the uh, mortality, again, the numbers are soft. These are soft numbers. Uh, this is from the literature. Um, I, I really couldn't get the hardest numbers. Uh, that that uh, I wish it was a little more substantive on the basis of what what I was able to derive, derive from the literature. So. 0.005% means that there'd be five in a thousand people uh, who have drug reactions who die, and uh, two in a thousand people with food allergies. And I think that number is low. I think the food allergy numbers actually increased because the incidence of food allergies so dramatically up in the last decade or two uh, with anaphylaxis. We all hear about anaphylaxis all the time. Uh, we don't hear about deaths from anaphylaxis very often, but the incidence is really up. And then stinging insect, is, I think that number is probably right here. There are probably about 50 people in the United States every year who die from a stinging insect bite. Somewhere between 50 and 200, but the number is probably 50. And the latex stuff that occurred during the AIDS, the onset of AIDS with the rush of getting gloves out uh, for everybody to start wearing, um, that's kind of fallen away so that the, the real health care sphere we had from latex sensitivity is, is still there. Uh, but you can see from the incidence that it's really way, way down from what it was um, a long time ago. So this is some data that's a little scary, and I put it on this part of the slide, but it actually could refer back later when I talk about treatment. This is a study that Alan Bach did uh, in 2001. He looked at 32 people who had died from anaphylaxis, 
mostly young, two to 33. And uh, peanut and tree nuts had caused the overwhelming number of uh, reactions. Uh, the people who died had asthma. And so you die from anaphylaxis uh, from either a low blood pressure, throat edema, or severe asthma. And uh, most of these people had an asthma. The scary part of this is that all of them had been prescribed um, an automatic epinephrine injector, and almost none of them had it with them, and only one of them had used it and died. And so the, no matter the, the thing that we bring to the table is we recognize anaphylaxis, know how to treat it, and get patients theoretically uh, with an automatic epinephrine uh, injector in their pockets, and, you know, patients are real people. <laughs> they, they don't carry their epinephrine, and they forget how to use it, and, uh, and then they don't use it. And so uh, no matter what we try to do, uh, this is the frustrating part. So all of these people basically had, had epinephrine prescribed to them, and none of them were carrying it or none of them used it. What affects the uh, risk of anaphylaxis is that uh, kids um, are, are, you know, we were all kids once, and we were all stupid at 17. And uh, so kids do risk taking that they shouldn't do. Uh, older people have a higher risk of dying from medication, the insect venom, uh, because of cardiovascular issues. Uh, they have asthma, it's a major issue with anaphylaxis. We know that people who have severe uh, rhinitis and dermatitis increase their risk of reacting to food. So those kids that come in and are the basket cases that have bad eczema, bad rhinitis and peanut allergy are at the highest risk. Anybody who's had a past reaction um, has a much higher risk of having a severe second reaction. And if they're on beta blockers or ACE inhibitors, it increases the severity of anaphylaxis and also um, impairs treatment and puts them at greater risk. So these are some of the factors that go into who's in the uh, greatest danger from having a reaction. So um, <laughs> this slide's uh, only partially correct, uh, and I'll take the insect uh, saliva. I actually couldn't find a fire ant, so I put that in as a placeholder until I got a fire ant. <laughs> so <laughs> the uh, you don't. Uh, I have never heard of anybody um, uh, anaphylaxing from mosquito bites. You do get allergic reactions to mosquito bites, and I guess it's conceivable that some poor guy is going to have so much IgE anti mosquito saliva that he could anaphylax, but that's really a placeholder for fire ants. And fire ants and stinging insects, Hymenoptera, um, are the uh, two things that cause uh, major reactions. Um, I, I noticed last night we were having this brief discussion about foods, and the, I think it was the waiter, um, or somebody asked us about why uh, people are reacting to food so much, and uh, gosh, the answer is uh, I don't know the answer either. And But we certainly... When I was a kid, many years ago, <laughs> uh, nobody had peanut allergies. It was, it was unheard of. And so over the last uh, several generations, we've gone from non-existent problem, or almost non-existent, to one where as many as 10% of kids are allergic to foods of some sort, peanut, nut, um, milk, egg. And um, in my office, we're doing every single day between two and four food challenges to try to identify whether the kid can or cannot eat foods. Because we have these kids that come in and they're eating almost no foods and that their nutrition's terrible. So we have to go through systematically trying to enlarge their food diets so they can eat food uh, without anaphylaxing. And you know, it's a, it's a very interesting issue, uh, one that we think is quite important. And this incidence is, is astoundingly increased. And my guess is that we don't know why it's increasing, but it's certainly increasing at a great rate, and it's probably going to continue to increase. And so, you know, I mean, there, you know, people ask about the future of the allergy specialty, and the answer is it's going to be huge. We're seeing what, many more people allergic, and food allergies, I hope it's not the driving force, but it's certainly going to be a driving force. Um, I take care of primarily adults, and I'm astounded at the number of people who come in and are allergic to six or seven different antibiotics. And they come to me and say, well, what can I take? I don't know what you can take. And so what I end up doing is graded um, uh, oral challenges to antibiotics to identify uh, what antibiotics they can't take. And I'll tell you, there's nothing a little more frightening than giving someone an antibiotic and having them out of flax in your office that you initiated in the hopes you could find an antibiotic that they can take. 
Um, aspirin is not an anaphylaxis. It's a biochemical reaction, but it's sudden and scary and can kill people. And so I've got it listed here. I'm going to talk about uh, some of the monoclonal stuff in a few moments. And the most frequent thing that we see uh, in our office is immunotherapy-related anaphylaxis. Fortunately, the way we do immunotherapy, it's graded, and most of the anaphylaxis is relatively mild. So we only get to see a scary anaphylaxis maybe once a year. But we certainly, as allergists, get to see plenty of anaphylaxis. We know how to treat it. So if you look at um, the AIDS populations, um, food is the uh, uh, number one uh, problem in uh, children. There, there's no question about that. And stinging insect um, uh, is uh, the number one, uh, sorry, well, medication is actually number one in adults, but in this list, which could cause adults and children, it would be food, stinging insects, medications, and uh, I'm gonna come back to idiopathic. But if you take it um, in, a, in different populations, um, you can see that at the, uh, in the adult population, we uh, don't make a diagnosis of what the cause of anaphylaxis is in as many as 60% of patients. Um, and so uh, if the idiopathic anaphylaxis is a patient population, I've probably seen two or 300 patients with, with uh, idiopathic, and that means that they don't have food, medication, exercise, or, or identifiable causes for anaphylaxis, most of them are female, and that's absolutely my experience. Um, I end up following these patients. I put them on treatment. Um, we can talk about that later. It's strictly anecdotal the way I uh, approach this, and um, most of the patients do well. These are, this is not a problem that most of them have um, repeatedly, although I certainly have experience with patients who have had idiopathic types of anaphylaxis every week or every, every month. Um, and so gets to be pretty frightening. So newly recognized causes for anaphylaxis. I'm gonna take you through this. Um, there's some interesting stuff here uh, that um, unless you look at the literature, you may not be aware of. Um, and so um, this is actually a fairly old, so the uh, bill wasn't, uh, but Paul, you were there when we were doing the patients in um, the, um, that would come down to the NIH, to the RT clinic, get skin tested, before they got uh, horse serum, for example. And uh, this is cisplatin. We, were, uh, with it, we identified that cisplatin caused anaphylaxis in a fair amount of patients who were pretreating a lot of the chemotherapeutic agents um, before they uh, got treated uh, for uh, bladder cancers. And then um, here's some uh, new things. These chimeric anti-IL-2 receptors will cause anaphylaxis. Uh, taxol and other taxanes will cause anaphylaxis. Turns out that this uh, product uh, that I've never uh, used or had, had experience with, this uh, docataxol, causes anaphylactoid reactions in up to 42% of patients on the first administration. And those patients would all be treated with H1, H2 antihistamines and steroids prior to, prior to um, their uh, receiving uh, these products. That's the pretreatment that I end up using uh, for any patient I think is at risk for anaphylaxis. Here's Tumor necrosis factor alpha. There are several different preparations of it. Um, the, the rheumatologists are all using this product, particularly Umera. Um, and again, H1, H2, and steroid pretreatment allows most of the patients to receive these products, although there's a risk of anaphylaxis. And so um, these three monoclonals are frequently causing anaphylaxis. Um, and now let's get to alpha gal. Alpha gal is a fascinoma described uh, by the guys in Charlottesville, Virginia, Tom Platts Mills. Um, I thought it was a curiosity when he first started talking about this about uh, six or seven years ago. And um, we now have a couple of patients in our practice. I'm in Washington, D.C., which is really kind of above the place uh, in the country where the tick that manifests, this alpha-gal, um, lives. So we don't see this particular tick. But a lot of our uh, patients will go down to Virginia for hunting and fishing. And those are the patients that get at increased risk. So uh, alpha-gal stands for uh, galactose alpha-1,3 galactose. And that is a uh, structure that we all have in our bodies. It's related to the ABO blood group. And so they, the, what makes ABO in part um, is this alpha-gal uh, configuration. And so um, all of us have antibodies, IgG antibodies, 
directed against formations of alpha-gal. Some patients produce IgE antibodies to, to uh, alpha-gal, and it turns out that, that those patients, at least so far, and this is a broadening area that's just new and broadening, um, uh, have been bitten by the uh, Lone Star Tick. That Lone Star Tick is in the, in the southeast. Um, it goes up as high as Virginia. It doesn't come into Maryland, but it comes into southern Virginia and eastern Virginia, and then spreads out west uh, through Tennessee, Kentucky, and all the southern states. And this Lone Star Tick, like a mosquito, when he bites you, salivates. I mean, we're tasting him, makes him, we salivate. It's actually the saliva keeps the blood from coagulating so they can have a blood meal without the blood coagulating. And so the saliva contains proteins, anticoagulants, including alpha-gal, uh, that then some people, the allergic population, who gets repeatedly bitten, uh, make IgE antibodies directed at the alpha-gal. My patient from, uh, is from the eastern shore of Maryland and is a fisherman and a hunter and goes to Virginia hunting deer and has been bitten many times by ticks and uh, he turned out to uh, then have reactions to eating meat, which has alpha-gal in it. So as you go through this, turns out this monoclonal antibody, of which I had not heard about before reading um, for, the, uh, uh, for anaphylaxis, uh, has been used to treat colorectal cancer, and um, there are patients who uh, react on the first treatment, and this particular uh, monoclonal has an alpha-gal structure to it. It's from the mouse germline that the um, antibody, the monoclonal antibody is created from, it has an active alpha-gal in it, and patients react to it, particularly in um, the southwest, the southeast. And so 22% of patients in the Mid-South region who have this Lone Star Tick exposure react to this monoclonal antibody, 3% overall in the United States, but much more in the South, and that's because of this silly little tick. So this tick, I, I, I chose this picture because it shows the, uh, uh, the tick very clearly. It's a small tick. If you put it on your hand, you would see a small, a very small insect. Visible, but he's tiny. Um, and of course, he's got this white spot uh, that makes it the Lone Star tick. What happens is the people get bitten by the uh, tick. They make IgE antibodies against it. <clears throat> and then they eat meat. And meat contains alpha-gal. And so they'll have the meat, they eat it, um, it's, they have to digest um, the uh, protein, which then, over the time, it gets through your stomach and intestine and gets absorbed. As it gets in your body, three, four, five hours later, the IgE reacts to the alpha-gal that's getting into your circulation, and then you anaphylax. So it's a delayed anaphylaxis. And the only case of delayed anaphylaxis that I know about. And so this is not a late phase reaction. It's not a biphasic anaphylaxis. It's a late onset of exposure to the antigen um, that has to get into the blood. If you're suspected, there's now blood tests for IgE alpha-gal uh, available, and they seem to be pretty accurate. We've, we've been getting them. Um, the other thing you can do is you can do a, a skin test of fresh meat, um, and including, if you want to, it's dermal. I've only done prick-prick. We take fresh meat prick the meat, prick the skin, um, and uh, look for a skin test reaction. Uh, you could do an oral challenge. I've never done one. We haven't had the, the need to do one, but I can see uh, where that would be applicable. So this is a brand new form of, of anaphylaxis. It applies to beef, pork, lamb, and even some milk products. There is a suggestion, I'm just gonna tell you that there is some data, not much yet, didn't warrant getting on the slide, about cats. Uh, having alpha-gal in their saliva, and people getting allergic to alpha-gal uh, through cat saliva, um, and uh, we'll see how that plays out. Does this only occur in atopic people who would make IgE? Yeah. All right, so then all of us are, are overwhelmed by the HAE um, pharmaceuticals uh, today, and it turns out there is some anaphylaxis to each of the HAE products. I just got them listed here. We're not going to spend time on it. If you're the, we are the center for um, uh, HAE in our community, so we have 52 families of HAE that we take care of, and so all the patients are coming in to get infused, and frankly, we have not had any severe anaphylaxis, but we're aware that all of these products can cause anaphylaxis. 
So anaphylaxis, uh, very straightforward. Uh, the, uh, you trigger uh, mast cells, they release their mediators. The major mechanisms are, as in all allergic reactions, smooth muscle contraction, vasodilation, most importantly, increased vascular permeability, which is caused, what causes swelling, and uh, mucus secretion, amongst other things. These are the major factors. If, in order to make the diagnosis of anaphylaxis, you have to recognize the clinical symptoms and signs that are associated with anaphylaxis. The most common occur in the skin and the mucosa. And so about 80 to 90% of patients will get hives, itching, flushing, and angioedema. We, were doing, we did a set of experiments uh, in the 80s that I think was a really uh, fascinating set of experiments uh, done before everybody got so uptight in doing clinical experiments. We infused histamine into normal volunteers um, and then asthmatics, anticipating that we would cause uh, asthma with histamine intravenously and uh, that we could then study it. Well, it turned out we couldn't cause asthma. You had to use too high a concentration. But we did get the, uh, the earliest signs of anaphylaxis. And it turns out that everybody flushes. The very first sign of histamine secretion, uh, histamine in the blood, is facial flush in the malar region. So you get flushing. And the second thing that happens is your, your pulse pressure, the difference between systolic and diastolic, the pulse pressure, widens. So you get a drop in your diastolic and a little increase in your systolic. So those are the first two things that happen associated with tachycardia. So um, I've always thought that flushing, when I see a patient in the office, if they're having a, an allergic reaction uh, to uh, uh, immunotherapy, and uh, David Johnson can tell you that, I, that I've always preached this, you can tell when you walk in, you see the kid react, uh, uh, sitting in the chair, if his face is flushed, you get epinephrine. And because um, then they're having histamine release. If the face isn't flushed, you can watch them. I mean, you might still treat them with epinephrine, but I often don't. I'll watch them. I might give them a bit of agonist or what have you. But um, the fl facial flushing has, for me, always been the first sign of anaphylaxis. Not everybody gets this, but at least 80 to 90% of patients with anaphylaxis will have skin or mucous membrane manifestations. Tachycardia is seen um, as one of the first signs of anaphylaxis. Uh, we see asthma only in the asthmatic patient, and they may cough. The thing you worry about is strider, and so getting angioedema of uh, the uh, throat um, is uh, one of the two things that can cause death very quickly from anaphylaxis. The other thing is uh, to have hypotension. Uh, so tachycardia, hives, flushing, and then, uh, and then shock, which is the thing that causes patients to pass out. <clears throat> we always ask about bloating, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. We have had uh, either two or three patients, I think one of them was David's, who got an allergy shot um, in our office and felt like they had cramping. It turned out it was probably uterine cramping. It was the first sign of anaphylaxis. And um, so, uh, I have not ever seen that before, but females can get uterine cramping as a sign of anaphylaxis. And I can, if we have time, we can talk about the mast cells in the uterus. One of the things I always ask about um, is a metallic taste and also the fear of impending doom. If, they're, if you're trying to think out whether the patient had anaphylaxis, if they are having anaphylaxis, they think the bottom's coming off and they're, they're going to die. So you ask about fear of impending doom because that separates them from other things that can cause some of the same symptoms. So here's the spectrum of symptoms that you can see with anaphylaxis. Uh, the cardiovascular system is a, a histamine working through both H1 and H2 receptors that cause vasodilation, hypotension, and flushing, decrease of uh, blood pressure. But the increased vascular permeability is the scary part. That's what causes hives, angioedema, and then what we see is that over time, it takes about 30 to 45 minutes, the GI system gets permeable, they'll get bloating, that's, that's, that's a swelling of the viscera, and then the fluid moves into the lumen and they get um, explosive uh, diarrhea because they've taken all that fluid from the, lumen, from the um, wall of the GI tract, moved it into the, uh, into the inner side, inside, and then expel it. With that, you get a tremendous loss of volume and hypotension. So you've moved 20% of your vascular bed 
into the into uh, the tissue as edema fluid, depending where the tissue is, and that's why you get hypotensive. And so the treatment for the low volume is to give huge amounts of colloid. And, it, and uh, I remember uh, there was a, some of you may recall this, back when Hopkins was in its heyday, they were anaphylaxing patients with uh, stinging insects under controlled conditions. And they had, they had several cases that really got scary. If you read the report, you couldn't believe it, where they took patients and stung them, they went into profound anaphylaxis, and there's a 20 liters of fluid to keep their blood pressure up, and they were getting stung in the office under controlled environment. Uh, and so, you know, it's just one of those situations. You have to be very well aware of the patients. If they go past a certain level without treatment, they may need a lot of fluid. Here's some of uh, the lure of anaphylaxis. Uh, skin, oral, and throat symptoms are usually the first ones noted. Some people will not have that. Um, respiratory symptoms occur in 40 to 70 percent, GI in about 30 um, percent. You don't see shock unless they're, they're profoundly um, uh, having problems, and that's from either low blood pressure or loss of volume or both. <clears throat> Signs and symptoms are usually seen within 30 minutes, which is why we, uh, we recommend keeping patients in the office for 30 minutes after an allergy shot. Since skin symptoms are the most common, but this is, now this last one is absolutely the, the scary part. The quicker a patient reacts to whatever incitement uh, he's had, the more dangerous it is. So those patients who get their allergy shot and two minutes later are reacting are the ones you better be concerned about. Those that wait 20, 30 minutes before they have a reaction, they're also capable of having a profound reaction, but they're not anywhere near as scary as the ones that have an, um, an immediate reaction. And the same goes with when you get a call, you know, Johnny ate a, you know, something that had peanut in it, and he started reacting within two minutes, uh, you better be aware that that's a dangerous sign. Uh, so the earlier the onset, the more ser serious the reaction. There is a late phase reaction, a biphasic anaphylaxis, where uh, some patients will have an immediate reaction, and then uh, anywhere from one to eight, or even, there's even claims to be 24 hours later, they'll have a late phase reaction, this late phase reaction can be severe, um, and uh, the question is, um, is it immunologic, or was it that they were undertreated during the initial phase? Um, it usually involves uh, the same organ system, and the severity can't be um, uh, predicted. Um, there's a question about giving whether inadequate dosing of epinephrine leads to this, and I, I don't know, I don't think that's the answer. Um, Steroids don't prevent the late phase reaction, but they tend to, to uh, reduce the severity of it. Um, and the second reaction can be fatal. That's the scary part. Um, the uh, patients have had um, who get complete resolution of the symptoms within 30 minutes generally do not have a late phase. So those patients in our office who get immunotherapy and have a reaction who get better as you're watching them with, with a one shot of epinephrine, you usually don't have to worry about them. Uh, if you're really concerned, you have to watch those patients overnight. So, um, the uh, diagnosis of anaphylaxis. <clears throat> if you have an acute reaction that involves the skin or mucosa and airway compromise or lower blood pressure, that constellation probably means anaphylaxis. If you are exposed to a known allergen and you have skin or mucosa, airway compromise, low blood pressure, or GI symptoms, two of those, you're likely to have anaphylaxis. If you have hypertension within minutes of, uh, of exposure, you're likely to have anaphylaxis. And so you've got to be aware that anaphylaxis is not clear cut. And the real thing is you have to recognize patients getting exposed to something, whatever it is they're sensitive to, and then having a constellation of symptoms. So you want to be able to recognize it both for treatment and for prophylaxis, how to advise the patient. Differential diagnosis. Vasovagal was the one uh, that, uh, so you give a patient, um, let's just use right now a current thing, a flu shot. Well, some people can react to flu shots. It's relatively rare. Uh, but you give a patient a flu shot, and 30 seconds later, they pass down. <clears throat> is that anaphylaxis, or is it vasovagal? Okay? So how do you distinguish between anaphylaxis and vasovagal? Well, anaphylaxis, the patient's flush, they turn red, 
and they have tachycardia. Everybody here has seen vasovagal. They've even experienced it. You get pale as a sheet, you sweat, and you have bradycardia. So that's easy. You take their pulse and you look at their face. If they're pale and sweaty and the pulse is slow, it's vasovagal, you give them atropine. If they're red and tachycardia, you give them epinephrine. Okay, so that's, that's the most frequent differential diagnosis, and it's the one we face in the office all the time. Flushing syndromes are usually not associated with hypotension. Carcinoid can be exactly like anaphylaxis. And so those carcinoid, first of all, there's rare sense teeth. I've seen uh, my whole career about six carcinoids. That's after over 45 years now. Um, and uh, they've always been uh, patients who had recurring symptoms. The way it works is that for carcinoid to cause anaphylaxis, the tumor has to metastasize to the liver. And then it comes out of the liver, that bypasses the liver. Otherwise, GI mediators get cleared by the liver. And so you don't get symptoms. Or about 7% of carcinoids can be in the lung. And if they're in the lung, then they, they bypass the liver, and you can have systemic symptoms. So it's either two things. They have carcinoid in the lung, or they have metastatic carcinoid in the liver. For them, they get symptoms. Metastatic carcinoid in the liver is not a good thing. Um, and... Um, all right, so that hyperventilation syndrome, you should be able to distinguish. If you're at all concerned, just do a PaO2. It should be, it's 100%. Globus hystericus is this horrible old name for people who get um, uh, throat closure. And I think most Globus hystericus today um, is actually from laryngopharyngeal reflux. And uh, I, I don't see where that would be much of a differential. Um, HAE, um, everybody who's seen HAE um, knows that it's a slow onset. Uh, usually it takes 24 hours to, uh, to fully manifest versus anaphylaxis, which takes seconds to minutes. Um, other causes of shock, scombroid poisoning in this area where you have so much seafood um, uh, could potentially be an issue. And that's where you have a big fish like a red snapper who is not processed quickly and the bacteria in the fish can make histamine, uh, produce histamine. So when you eat the fish, you're eating a meal of histamine and then you can get poisoning from the histamine you ingest. Um, and then mastocytosis we'll talk about. So systemic mastocytosis, these are patients that have too many mast cells. And um, the fascinating disease, there's some things here that are just uh, blow me away um, that we've now recognized. Um, in the patients that I see who have recurring anaphylaxis, we always are ruling out systemic mastocytosis. And the, the way we do it is, at least the way I do it, is by a, a, a histamine in the um, a serum and uh, a urinary histamine are the two things that I screen with. We look very closely at their skin. You mean and histamine or tryptic? No, uh, urinary histamine. Histamine, histamine metabolites, plasma uh, tryptase, or serum tryptase. Um, the, uh, you look very closely at the skin for urticaria pigmentosa. It's a freckle-like lesion. It has a salmon, uh, so a slightly reddish color, the, compared to most freckles. And if you're concerned, you scratch it. Uh, you'd like it like you do a dramatographic testing. And if it's a, um, a mast cell, mast cell uh, rest, it'll swell up and cause a hive. And so you, that's called derriere sign. It's a classic way to look for a pigmentosa. And the most common areas to see that is around the flank. And so I usually look from the mid chest uh, through the abdomen and around the back these freckles. That's the place you see them most commonly. We had this guy that came in, uh, I couldn't believe this guy, to the NIH when I was there, and he was anaphylaxing, and we kept him in the hospital. At that time, we had a, a protocol. We put him in the hospital, and under our eyes, he developed urticaria pigmentosa um, and became, it became mastocytosis. And uh, so these, these uh, tumors can uh, develop very quickly. Um, you see them uh, most exuberantly in younger people with anaphylaxis. Um, and uh, so you need to be able to look for that. Most patients who have uh, mastocytosis do not have high IgE. You biopsy the mast cells in the bone marrow, and they're, sh they're, they're spindle shaped instead of being round and atypical. Um, they're found to have a lot of point mutations, um, the CKIT receptor gene, um, and other abnormalities in both CKIT receptor and CD2 um, and 25. The, uh, so there's uh, mastocytosis, where you have too many mast cells. 
And now there's mast cell activation syndrome, which is certainly what some of our patients with idiopathic anaphylaxis uh, have. And these are people who have mast cells that react uh, for God who knows what reason um, and will have cause anaphylaxis. And so um, at least 20 to 40 percent of the patients that have uh, recurring anaphylaxis have mast cell activation syndromes. It's fascinating. So the question came up of um, uh, there's a phenomena here that patients who get stinging insect bites, bee stings, and anaphylax, and are seen in your office, and their skin tests are negative. Well, you know, we've all seen those patients. And uh, there was a case here in Seattle uh, that might have been uh, related to this a few years ago, a court case that was pretty famous in the allergy literature. And um, we now recognize that patients who react to stinging insect and have negative skin tests to stinging insect venom have, masses, have this mast cell activation syndrome, and the venom is triggering the mast cells to secrete, and they have anaphylaxis, but they don't have IgE antibodies to venom. The venom is directly activating the mast cells. So it's one of the triggers for mast cell activation. So it's a fascinating insight. Those of you who get a stinging insect patient and they have negative skin tests, you look at a mast cell activation syndrome. And so um, these patients generally do not have um, urticaria pigmentosa. They generally have flushing, um, hives, they can get angioedema, um, they get hypotensive. Um, their, their tryptase uh, during a reaction is elevated, uh, but, but at baseline can be completely normal. Um, we, we do histamine um, in the urine and uh, plasma tryptase. Um, and um, you ha if you're really concerned, um, you want to do a bone marrow biopsy, and you look at the uh, mast cells to make sure they don't have mast cell mitosis. So it's a, it's a relatively newly recognized syndrome. Uh, this is looking at um, the time course. So plasma histamine goes up and comes down pretty quickly, usually in around 30 minutes, even though this slide shows 60. The tryptase goes up and um, can last uh, for three or four hours. I end up doing uh, urinary histamine, not a histamine metabolite, um, and uh, as my screening test. And with uh, mastocytosis, it's always elevated. And if you get the bladder with has urine in it from the time of the reaction, it'll be elevated in the urine as well. And so that's why I look at um, urinary histamine. So serum tryptase. Um, the serum tryptase in anaphylaxis can be normal. But if it goes up two nanograms above a baseline, which means you draw a tryptase during the reaction, and then you draw a tryptase when the patient's not having a reaction, and if it's up two nanograms from the baseline, then you have a pretty good likelihood that even though it's not abnormal, that it was elevated from whatever triggered it. Um, so it may not be up in, in food allergies. Um, it is more likely to be up in hypotensive patients, um, and other things can cause it. We do see uh, AML causing increased tryptase. And we always, we, we follow the tryptase levels in our patients with idiopathic um, anaphylaxis. I know I'm covering a lot of things quickly. Um, all right, so what do you do when you have a patient who has anaphylaxis? Well, you'd want to have him referred to someone like you and me uh, to take a look at him, try to identify triggers. That means you've got to take a really good history. Uh, we often do um, uh, what are called prick pricks. And so I, I have, um, I'm disenchanted with uh, the, skin, the food skin tests we have available to us. Remember, these were processed a um, year ago. They're, uh, they're extracted. The enzymes that are in there uh, are not stable. And so if you really want to test the food, we, we have the patients bring in the meal that they ate that triggered the reaction. They'll go to the restaurant or they'll bring it from home. And we actually test the foods themselves or components of the foods themselves with a prick prick. We found that to be better uh, than the regular skin testing. You can do RAS testing or other uh, serum IgEs. And the, other, the, the thing that you really have to do if you want to be sure is do challenge testing. Um, remember that there's a period of time where patients after anaphylaxis are refractory, and so you don't want to test them for three to four weeks after the reaction. So what I do is, um, when I have a patient with anaphylaxis, uh, we try to instruct them about how 
um, the, to avoid anaphylaxis, particularly you know, recognize what to do. The, the issue with people is eating. Um, food allergies uh, are the thing we probably see the most frequently. And you try to talk to people about being careful not to eat food that they're not sure of. So I'm doing a, a case, I, I can't spend a lot of time on this, but in Florida where a girl, 23 year old, known anaphylaxis, she had um, a hospitalization uh, when she was in her teens, known to be uh, peanut allergic. She was a waitress. I can't tell you why she did it. Um, they were testing the foods. They, and they, I guess in the waitress industry, they test the desserts. Uh, they can, rec they can uh, describe them to their clients. And foolishly, she took a bite of a, of a, of a cupcake. It had nuts in it. She didn't think it had nuts in it. Um, she didn't recognize it uh, instantly. She ended up swallowing it. Long story short, she panicked. Um, didn't get her up in effort for probably three to five minutes out of her uh, uh, pocketbook. Uh, they started to drive her to the hospital. They didn't call 911. I don't know why. And uh, she, in the moving car, she decided to give herself up in effort, and it didn't work. And uh, the, the, the needle bent or something, and she didn't get the, uh, the shot, and she died. And so, you know, you try, that's the, the circumstance. You, you don't want anybody that you know to have that circumstance. And so you talk to them, you train them, um, you talk about signs and symptoms. And what I do is every single time a patient comes in who has an epinephrine carrying, I ask them to have them to show me their epinephrine. Now, they all know it. They all know I'm going to ask them for their epinephrine. So they probably all put it in their pocketbook the day they come to see me. Uh, but uh, they all know I'm going to ask for it. I look at the epinephrine and make sure it's in date. Um, <laughs> and, um, and then I give them a trainer, either the EpiPen trainer or the OBQ trainer, and I say, inject yourself. And it's amazing to me that I've done this a dozen times to these patients, and they still do it wrong. They'll, you know, you know, and I go through and retrain, and I retrain every single time I see those patients. I retrain it, and just for our, uh, as you know, I then document that I've retrained them on epinephrine administration in the note. Um, and so, but I do it every single time I, I see a patient. I ask all of my patients to wear uh, many alert bracelets. Now that the, the uh, the Medi I like the standard Medialert bracelet, $35, stainless steel. It's got a red uh, cross on it, and uh, it's quite visible. I wear them only, I ask them only to wear bracelets, not anklets or belly button rings or anything. Uh, the, uh, I want them, it's got to be something that's quite visible. I don't want them to carry something in the wallet because, you know, nobody goes through your wallet when you're having anaphylaxis. And I tell them that if they're unconscious, the EMTs are not going to give them epinephrine. That's not a standard protocol. They only give epinephrine if they know it's anaphylaxis. And so they've got to have, an EM, they've got to have the medial bracelet. And they can go online. There are beautiful uh, uh, medial bracelets. You can spend $1,000 on a medial <laughs> bracelet. It's platinum with diamonds and all sorts of things. Um, and uh, you know, if you run out of diamonds on the bottoms of your shoes, you can put them on your medial bracelet. <laughs> um, but at any rate, I really push people to do it. I would say that I get maybe 50% compliance with the, with the menu or bracelet. I tell them they, they really need to be careful with that. They, they should have it. The uh, first line treatment uh, is, of course, uh, epinephrine. Um, and uh, this slide uh, shows the uh, a, a prototype of a, an EpiPen kind of an adapter. I'm going to show you some more information in just a minute. Um, and uh, you have epinephrine. The adult dose is 0.3 milligrams. The pediatric dose is about half that. Uh, up to um, about 30 kilograms, and um, the uh, the sooner you give it, the better. And you can repeat it in five to 15 minutes, depending if you need it or not. You call 911. Epinephrine is the treatment of choice for anaphylaxis. So it's astounding to me that as well trained as our emergency room clinicians are, that our emergency room doctors do not give epinephrine, but a small number of times. They still give Benadryl and corticosteroids overwhelmingly. They don't give epinephrine. They don't prescribe epinephrine. They don't talk to the patient about carrying epinephrine. And uh, to me, that's one of the great failings we have uh, with anaphylaxis. And I don't understand it. But we have to all recognize that anaphylaxis is treated with epinephrine. And so it should be administered immediately, as soon as you can as you recognize the syndrome, if the patient's needed. Now, we have uh, lots of people who anaphylax in our office 
from immunotherapy that you might think it's mild enough that you don't need anaphylaxis, but you're watching those patients very closely. At least we, we, are, we never let them out of our sight. And uh, the first sign of, a, of an issue, you give up an effort. But I think that, you, as a rule of thumb, you give up an effort to every anaphylaxis. And you can certainly repeat it um, as needed. We usually don't have to in the office. Um, you also need to be aware of the biphasic reaction. Um, the symptoms that all well, patients come in with a, with a whole spectrum of symptoms. <clears throat> Epinephrine acts uh, on the alpha receptors, beta receptors, and with that causes vasoconstriction, increases the peripheral resistance, which brings the blood pressure back, reduces vascular permeability, which reduces the edema, uh, bronchodilation, stops subsequent mediator release, causes increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, um, and so all of these things um, are life-saving. And so there's nothing that competes with epinephrine for efficacy. We now have, in the, in the United States, three different um, epinephrine um, administrators, and I wanted to summarize quickly um, what's going on with that. We've had the um, uh, EpiPen, EpiPen Jr. Uh, uh, on, in the United States for about 25 years. It's the number one product. I don't know the percentage in the market, but it's overwhelmingly the number one product. And uh, it contains 0.3 or 0.15 um, milligrams of epinephrine. Um, it comes in an outer case. There's a, a needle inside, um, and I'll show you a picture of one in a minute. Now, there's a similar product called AdrenaClick. I have never seen an AdrenaClick. I've never used one. I've never prescribed one. But it is available as a, a generic. And there are some pharmacies that are substituting AdrenaClick for uh, the other two products if you don't specify brand uh, only. I don't have any, I have nothing against AdrenaClick. It may be a great product. I have no experience with it. And maybe you guys do. I, I've never used it. I've never seen one. The problem I have with it is that I train patients on how to use the automatic epinephrine injectors. And I never trained against adrenaline. And I don't want patients to have a product that they don't know how to use. And so I'm very strongly against adrenaline unless I have one where I can start training it. It may turn out to be as good a product. I just can't comment about it. The newest player on the block is a fascinating new product called AuviQ. Um, just approved in the market about a year ago. What AuviQ is, is it's a, I'll show you a picture of it in a minute. It's a palm-sized little um, gizmo. And um, you, when you uh, open it up, it gives you a verbal instruction. Very straightforward, simple instruction. And so patients who are panicked or, or a friend of a patient who's anaphylaxing can open this up and get and get verbal instructions on what to do, and it's very straightforward. Um, and so there there are some advantages uh, to this uh, to the AVQ product, although we traditionally all of our patients, I'm sure all of your patients, are carrying um, the uh, epinephrine uh, from uh, EpiPen. And so uh, these are the two products. And what we're doing now uh, is uh, patients who are uh, on new to epinephrine are all being presented both products and we're letting them choose which one they want to take. And uh, some of the patients who come in uh, who have been carrying um, the EpiPen, we're presenting this new product and letting them make a choice as to which one they want to take so the patients are comfortable with it. Um, and, uh, uh, what do you think your, your patient's doing? Majority, what do they pick? Overwhelmingly, they're, they're choosing the AuviQ. Yeah, same. So uh, two out of every three patients are taking AuviQ. I bet it's 90%. It's, a, it's astounding to me. Um, even patients who carry the EpiPen for a dozen years are choosing the RBQ. So we had patients who, well, as I said, I retrain them on the, uh, on the EpiPen every time I see them. And I'm always amazed at how they'll take it out and fumble with it. They put their thumb on the top of it almost all the time. Yeah. You know, and so uh, there's a classic story, Paul. You might have been there with, with Cal Prusin, put his, uh, did the uh, epinephrine injection through his thumb with a patient, you know, DeKalb's one of the guys at the NIH, a very brilliant scientist who had never used an EpiPen before and uh, turned it upside down and, and injected a patient through his own thumb. And, uh, you know, you never, 
You never quite forget the side of a needle coming out through your thumb. <laughs> and so um, it's astounding to me that uh, patients, um, they get flustered with the EpiPen. I don't blame them. Uh, and uh, so they're all, they're, two out of three are choosing OBQ. And uh, now I, myelin is doing the right thing. They're making it much harder for the OBQ to come on the market. So they're making all kinds of incentives, uh, trying to keep people with the EpiPen which is a very fine product, and I'm not saying anything negative about it. It's just that I think that the RBQ has some advantages. Now, I thought I had a picture of the two of them to show you the comparative in size, but I think I blocked the slide. You know, so, it's what's surprising to me is that people who make EpiPen knew this product was coming for years, didn't do anything to retool their product. All they really have done is uh, advertise against it. Increase the price. Right. <laughs> Well, you know the FDA. It's not that easy to do. The OBQ story is a fascinating story. In the New York Times uh, about uh, three or four months ago, these two brothers, um, uh, young guys at uh, Harvard, were, uh, have uh, food allergies and were disenchanted with the EpiPen and created the OBQ. And uh, so I've talked to the, one of the brothers and the guy at uh, Sanofi who heralded this thing as an emergency room doc. And the two of them put, got together, the, the guy, uh, Sanofi, and um, the, uh, the two twins from Harvard, um, and created this product. And it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good thing to have on the market. It's nice to have competition. Here's some data, um, and I, I want you to look at this slide. And what you're looking at here um, is the data that the FDA reviewed to approve OBQ. So you have to go back um, a long time uh, to look at pharmacokinetics of uh, the EpiPen, which were done pre basically prehistorically. Uh, the, <clears throat> the FDA has gotten so much better over the last uh, uh, two decades. And uh, so this is really the only data you're ever going to see about epinephrine. And uh, the EpiPen in the dash line and OBQ in the solid line. And you can see that within, these are uh, <clears throat> 60 patients. 67 patients who got uh, either uh, epi, obq, epi, or obq, epi, obq, and uh, three different uh, administrations. And you're looking at the, uh, the plasma epinephrine, um, and the kinetics are that within five minutes, uh, both of them um, have uh, hit pretty close to their peak. Um, there is pretty much a sustained um, plasma epinephrine level out to an hour to an hour and a half. And um, the, there have been some issues made about the difference in the peak between Epi and OBQ. I don't think that's at all uh, meaningful. Uh, the real issue is that the uh, area under the curve is very comparable. These are, uh, I think, really terrific data. Is this, is this in, the, in the thigh or the deltoid? This was... That's an excellent question. I don't know the answer offhand. Okay, I have to go back. I, I, I don't know the answer. is the ideal place, but I, I know epinephrine Yes, but these were, see, these were, this was the real, they used epinephrine and uh, OBQ. And they probably did thigh, but I don't know that offhand. I've read this, yeah, but I just don't recall. Um, so they used the real, the, the question was raised to me very recently. Would they use the prototypes? They use the, the, the stuff that's on the market today. So these are the real, the real data. It's the only data you're ever going to see uh, for the epinephrine, uh, for EpiPen, because the uh, the old data doesn't uh, isn't done the same way. And so I think this is very, really good data. It shows that uh, both products work. And if you have patients that carry both products, they should do okay. Oh, here it is. Good. So this is palm sized. What we run into is that men just don't carry this. Um, it's too big. Um, and so, and especially, we're all administering dual kits now. And men just won't carry it. Women will carry it because they all carry pocketbooks. So it's, until we become metro men and start carrying, um, you know, like probably should, uh, carrying a little pocketbook, uh, men will just don't carry the EpiPen. So I, I know the patients that I, no matter how much I try to incentivize them to do it, Men just don't carry it. Um, and um, now you can see the instructions on the side of the, of the uh, epinephrine. And I'm astounded at how often I retrain people and they take it and they actually try to read what's said here. Like, 
because they don't remember how to use it. And just imagine if your heart is going 140 times a minute and your blood pressure is falling and your throat is swollen and you're trying to read the side of that package. That's scary. Now, so uh, I'll tell you a story. Um, a, a live uh, Avi Q got put into my one of my desk drawers. And I had a physician in, um, an emergency, a, a anesthesiologist I'm taking care of, who has recurring anaphylaxis. I don't know what, what her cause is, but she anaphylaxis uh, to foods and a variety of other things, including uh, menstrually related. And I demonstrated on her at first visit uh, Avi Q. And I was a little slow that day, and I took it out, and I thought it felt a little heavy. And when I opened it up to show her how to use it, it didn't say, this is a traitor. <laughs> Nonetheless, stupid me went ahead and put it on her leg and gave her epinephrine. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, it, it, she didn't get a bruise, which is good, and she did get epinephrine, which was good, because she was actually reacting to the skin testing I was doing at the same time, and she said she felt a heck of a lot better after the RBQ. Um, and I can tell you that in my hand, uh, when it fired, it was a small explosion. It was a, uh, I could tell that, I don't know how it fired, um, but it, it was a small explosion in my hand, and I could feel the needle going in, um, and there would be, it would have penetrated any piece of clothing that you had. There's no doubt about that. And so I've, I've had the on unexpected experience of administering RBQ, and I was impressed with it. Now, we've also all seen epinephrine. I don't know if you've ever used an EpiPen, but I've used an EpiPen, and it also works quite reliably. So these are good products, and we're lucky to have both products available in the market. So the key thing here is epinephrine is the first-line treatment. Um, prompt administration is critical. You could do other things. So we do, if patients are having asthma, and certainly in our um, immunotherapy uh, area, I'll give uh, inhaled beta agonist to anybody who's got a little bit of chest symptoms. So you can do that. You can do H1 antihistamines. Uh, usually the way I do things, and I'm not telling you this is the way to do it, but we never give an allergy shot to a patient who hasn't taken an oral antihistamine that day. So our, our immunotherapy center requires um, one of the, um, the second generation antihistamines, either the morning of or the night before an allergy shot. And our shot people ask routinely, have you taken your Zyrtec Claritin, whatever it is? And if they haven't, we'll give them an antihistamine and have them wait uh, 15 to 30 minutes before we give them the shot. And with that, we use very high dose immunotherapy. I think our incidence of anaphylaxis is way down compared to what you'd expect because of the dosing of immunotherapy that we use in our office. So it's not a standard. I'm not recommending it to you, but it's what I do, and I think it's the right thing to do. Uh, so what well, you do is up to you. up the question of leukotriene and Ignis and well, how, we don't what role do they play in anaphylaxis? And we often use them in, in shot patients to reduce their late reactions to shots. I mean, you give Singularity to have patients who are having adverse local reactions. Yeah. Yes, we do too. Um, but in terms of anaphylaxis, I, I don't worry about that. So we don't have our patients with Singular, but we do do Singular for uh, these uh, delayed reactions. Um, okay, post-discharge, you should, everybody's gotta have um, an epinephrine uh, automated in, uh, injector and training and retraining. I think everybody should be seen by an allergist. I think everybody has to see an allergist in order to identify what to do and what the cause is and for education and prevention. And I think with that, I have plenty more slides that you've got on your handout, but I'm gonna stop and answer questions. Thank you. You had earlier mentioned patients allergic to five or six antibiotics. Do you think allergic is the right word? That's a really good question, Len. The answer is no, but we've seen adverse reactions. Now, we haven't seen those patients when they're reacting. So we have to take it by history that they're getting rashes. It's almost always rashes. Um, and uh, so what I do is I try uh, to identify um, questionable reactions, and particularly something that's important, like, uh, like penicillin. And then I, I will bring them in and do an RL challenge, a graded RL challenge, and a uh, chance to get them on a product that they have identified something they can use. If by history, 
they have useful antibiotics that I think are, give them enough uh, coverage, I may not do that. Uh, but, uh, but I take a very careful history. And then, you know, all of us become really expert at the range of antibiotics that you have available and how to advent, and take these patients and advise their PCP of what they can use and what they can't use. And I tell them to call me uh, if there's any questions, the PCPs, and they do. There's a question from our uh, one of the outside <laughs> listeners. Um, about the alpha gal anaphylaxis, wouldn't the early or most noticeable symptom be cramping due to small bowel mucosal edema? But it's not. They get, they get systemic anaphylaxis. And they don't get the. Uh, so, so I don't know if everybody could hear that. So the question was, if you had the, the premise of this question is that if you have IgE alpha gal, you'd expect the intestinal wall. To react as the antigen gets absorbed across the wall from the uh, from digestive food. But what you see is systemic anaphylaxis. So they'll get full-fledged anaphylaxis. They may have bloating um, and diarrhea as part of the problem, but they're getting hives and flushing and hypotension. So they're getting systemic reactions. Yes? On the same topic, can they anaphylax with another tick bite? No. Reported. no. No. So they don't get enough systemic. No, I have no. They don't react to it. The, they get. We all get a little swelling with tick bites, but they don't have flaps with it. You mentioned H2 blockers a couple times early on. <clears throat> I had a, uh, a request for an Elizabeth and Hive patient refused because I hadn't tried an H2 <clears throat> blocker. Uh, right. Do you ever actually use them in uh, in this treatment? Yeah. Any phase of the treatment? Yes, I do. Uh, okay, so, and it's probably because I did the experiments to show them to work, and so um, I feel sort of proprietary. Uh, so we, the experiments that we did with histamine infusion showed that in order to prevent the vascular permeability and vasodilation, H1 uh, had a partial effect, H2 had a small effect, but you had to have both H1 and H2 to prevent the histamine reactions on the vascular bed. So the routine, I'm, now this is not anaphylaxis. <coughs> Well, it is. Let me, let me answer the question two ways. For urticaria angioedema, my first line of treatment is um, a nauseating antihistamine and um, a H2 antihistamine in the morning, the same thing, maybe another product, at night and singular. So it's H1, H2 in the morning, H1, H2 at singular in the evening. If they fail that, they go to double dose, and I'll sometimes take them to four times to go. So I'll, I'll go to two pills uh, twice a day of H1s. If that, so that's the first line treatment for urticaria, along with uh, Dave Jean, who just left our office and moved here, can confirm that I do food testing. Um, I do a food elimination diet, and everybody is a first line treatment, and I get enough results that it's worthwhile doing. And I, that's a whole different question, though. Um, and then for the where it relates to anaphylaxis is my routine treatment for recurring anaphylaxis of unknown cause. Is an H1, H2 in the morning, H1, H2 in singular in the evening. And overwhelmingly, the patients do well in that combination where they have, it reduces their frequency of anaphylaxis and certainly the severity. So I do as a routine. Now, in my office, not everybody does that, right, David? Um, so <clears throat> even though these guys have all seen my results, they end up doing, uh, one of our guys who specializes in urticaria and, and geodema, um just goes right away to two antihistamines, H1 antihistamines in the morning and two in the evening. And he doesn't do anything past that. And then automatically goes on to cyclosporin and, you know, Dapsone and Zolaire. Uh, but so there's a lot of ways to approach it. But my approach has been, I think, very effective. Paul, Any other questions? Do you ever recommend that people get the dual injector, the two, the two injection epinephrine pens instead of the single ones? We don't prescribe anything but dual. So every patient gets two, either OBQs or two EpiPens. But not the EpiPens that have two shots in them. So you're talking about the old twin jet? Yeah. I think that's gone. I think that's off the market. It was a very awkward, I don't know if you ever use it, it's gone and it went for a good reason. That second injection was manual and uh, was very hard to do. So we instructed them all. I, I didn't write that very often. Um, it was just too awkward to use. 
have a question on the uterine mast cells. I've, I've just seen it rarely where the first sign of anaphylaxis in women was incredibly painful uterine contractions. It was followed by hypotension. I've only seen like three, three women with that. Why isn't that more frequent to you? Uh, well, I, I, I got to tell you, the one, the David Spade, I think it was one of your picks, yeah, okay. and then maybe two other people, one or two other people. I had never heard of anybody having anaphylaxis to immunotherapy with uterine contraction. And uh, we had three of them in the last year, a year and a half, something like that. Yeah, the last few years. And, and none of the ones that I know in our practice had hypertension. Uh, Speak up, David. Yeah, the two I've had have been after immunotherapy. One was after a lab worker after a mouse fight. That was actually at the NIH as a fellow. She came by with painful uterine contractions and became uh, profoundly hypertensive. So the, the uterus is rich in mast cells. And um, the number of mast cells uh, proliferate every month during the menstrual cycle. Um, and then uh, cut back, the number diminishes uh, after ovulation. And um, during pregnancy, the number of mast cells in the uterus increase exponentially. And the thought is that partuition is initiated by mast cell degranulation. And that's what causes the uterus to start contracting. Um, and it's hormonally mediated. Um, so there are plenty of mast cells in the uterus, and you can get uterine reactions as part of the natural physiology. And if, for God only knows what reason, those mast cells degranulate, you would get uterine contractions. But we don't see it often. And as I say, the first three patients I ever remember seeing were all happened in the last year or two in, our, in our, one of our offices. And I can't explain why it seems so rarely. More questions? When you recommended the bone marrow biopsy for mast cell activation syndrome, are you trying to rule out mastocytosis? I mean, this, well, I guess my real question is, does MCAS have elevated levels of mastocytes? I mean, no, the, uh, no, the mast cell activation syndrome, that's, it's a rule out. Yeah. So when you have patients with mast cell activation syndrome, you're ruling out mastocytosis. Right which has a slightly different prognosis, although, frankly, we don't know. There's, a, there's so little known about mastocytosis and its frequency and the natural history of it that you don't know what that, what, really what's going to happen. But with, with uh, mast cell activation, you're ruling out mastocytosis okay. with a bone marrow biopsy. And you're looking at the C-kit um, components because there are some abnormalities in the C-kit ligand that relate to mast cell activation. Um, and so... Um, it's a, I've got to say, it's an evolving and incredibly fascinating part of uh, our purview. And I don't know where it's going to take us. I know that we're missing a lot of that. I mean, the idea of the stinging insect stuff, whether that applies to other anaphylaxis where you can't figure out the cause, <clears throat> does that mean we need to do a bone marrow, uh, that we need to do more careful analysis of mast cells in all those anaphylaxis patients, of which I've seen at least two or three hundred? Um, idiopathic anaphylaxis patients. And I may have missed a mast cell activation syndrome in all of those patients. Um, and uh, it might have prognosis that I don't, I don't, I can't even predict, but I think it's opening up a whole window we've never looked into before. So I think it's gonna be fascinating. A couple of other questions from our outside audience. One person says, uh, Ted Song, that in the UK there's an epinephrine device that gives 0.5 uh, ml or milligram familiar and the reason to rethink the dosing of the be? Well, uh, the, the, I guess the underlying question there is that why do we use 0.3 or 0.15? And that's all based upon stuff that some of us may remember the old epi kits that we had uh, from Center years and years and years ago um, were just uh, put together with a guess at the dose. Um, now, I will say that this data, though, back to it. This data is the first data I've ever seen uh, that tells you you're getting a dramatic increase of, uh, compared to baseline that's sustained for an hour to an hour and a half. I think this is pretty good data. And I'm not sure you need to go higher than that. Um, in the patients that we anaphylax, this dose works pretty much all the time. Or this dose may be uh, given twice. Um, the patients in the emergency room, remember, they're 
15, 30, 45 minutes late. There's a lot of things that have gone on where epinephrine uh, is competing against vascular loss, vascular permeability, and fluid volume loss that's sustained over time. So they're treating patients at a much different stage of anaphylaxis. And maybe a higher dose would be better, but I think this data is really impressive. Another question here I don't fully understand, but for a patient with a history of serious anaphylaxis to immunotherapy after decreasing their dose, at what point do you consider retitrating up their dose? I guess how long do you hold them or do you keep them at a lower dose forever? Would be the implication of the question. Okay, well, we all know that immunotherapy is an art, and there's a little science, but it's an art. And uh, my approach is that if I'm, what I'll do is I'll cut back the dose, pre treat the patients with antihistamines. Uh, I might consider singular, but I'll use antihistamines uh, before a re-injection, and then build them back. And if they have a reaction or they can't go past a certain level, I, I probably will not continue them on immunotherapy. I'm, I'm risk-averse enough that I don't want anyone to anaphylax. Um, Serving once is more than enough. And if the anaphylax twice, I won't continue on immunotherapy. I think you've answered this question already, but uh, no mention of leukotriene inhibitors in treatment. Should it be part of treatment for dual or late reactions? Well, there's no data whatsoever on giving um, a uh, singular like product, Montelukast like product, of in anaphylaxis. And so it's all whether you want to try it or not. Now, I can't tell you I have any experience with it. And does anybody else have experience they want to comment? Well, we, we tried it. I mean, I can't say how successful, but that and also typhotroxinase inhibitors, I do. Right. But, I mean, we're now looking at omelizumab for recurring anaphylaxis. Yeah, I think the future of omelizumab and uh, recurring anaphylaxis is great. So the NIH is is also doing a trial, and preliminarily it looks good. Um, and I think once it gets on the market for urticaria, then we're going to use it as a routine step in an anaphylaxis. Um, I, I think there's going to be a lot of Elizabeth employed um, in our population. I think that introduces the case that we're going to present. Uh, you want to grab a cup of coffee, and we'll just uh, present the case. Yeah, I just want to make sure that I'm going to do that one. Yeah, no, you know, that would be a good 
Uh, he took some Benadryl. Um, he recalled it lasting for a while, but by the morning he was okay. He hadn't had any new drug, any new food. This was a place he'd eaten frequently before. No new drugs, no stings, no exercise after the dinner or anything like that. Uh, and these sort of persisted. So again, two months after that, he had another episode that he attributed to eating um, Indian food, this time at a friend's house, uh, about an hour afterwards. <clears throat> and this time it was the same reaction, but also started to swell in the face objectively and felt that his throat was closing off. There he was seen in the ER and quite classically, as we heard, was not given epi, but was given antihistamines and steroids and it sort of resolved slowly. A month later or so, had another similar thing, this time eating some teriyaki chicken. Again, seen in the ER, no epi, but he was prescribed epi this time. And that's when he first got referred to an allergist in the community, so this is before I saw him. Um, there he, went, he underwent a lot of skin testing um, to the common stuff, plus anything else that the, he and, and that doctor could think of were in those foods, all of which was negative. He got tested just for general ATP as well to environmental allergen, and that was negative. He had normal spiro. Um, he had RAS testing to basically all the same stuff. As a double check, it was negative. He did get a baseline tryptase, which was 6.6. .6. Uh, CU index was negative, and he was not really having chronic urticaria and a variety of other stuff, in free day, including uh, free uh, catecholamines, metanephrines, uh, was normal. Um, so he was given an EpiPen and told to start daily antihistamine. There wasn't entirely clear what was going on at that point. He was labeled as, as idiopathic anaphylaxis. Uh, just as a side note, he went to a naturopath doc, had some IgA testing, which he didn't buy into anyway, and it didn't help at all. Um, so these continued in January of this year. He had one, and this one was not related to food exposure whatsoever. It had been over six hours since he last ate. Same thing, hives, so mainly facial uh, uh, flushing, itching, uh, angioedema, um, and this time he did not have bowel symptoms. He used his epi and he noted a clear improvement when he did. March had another episode uh, several hours after dinner. And this time, as he'd been instructed to, he went to the ER and got a triptase. It was 9.6, with a caveat that might have been like five or six hours after the reaction, so it was kind of late, but his baseline having been 6.6. Um, <coughs> and I guess at that time, he had a blood histamine checked as well, which was 41, which is in the normal range. Uh, and then he had been pretty averse to taking antihistamines for a variety of reasons we can talk about if, if relevant, but he, he did finally start taking them then. Um, he had been afraid it would just mask the symptoms and not really treat the underlying problem. He then had a kind of scary episode that woke him up from sleep at 2 a.m. one morning with definite angioedema, diarrhea, treated again with epi. Uh, he then went on to higher dose antihistamines. H2 blockers, which I don't think he ever actually took. Uh, Gastrochromy tried and didn't, didn't notice any change with that. He did say that the antihistamine seemed to make reactions less severe, but he did continue to have another reaction or two after that. So then he was referred to us, and by this point he had you know, six, eight or so serious reactions and several other possible more mild reactions every few months. Um, we got another baseline trip taste, which was interestingly quite low at 2.1. Um, we got a mature triptase, uh, which I've got started to get in some of these instances. It was normal. I got an IG that was normal, immunoglobulins that were normal. Um, I got a 24 hour urine prostaglandin D2. I was taught to do that in Boston. Uh, there aren't really normal <coughs> ranges for this, but um, that is certainly not high. Uh, I tried to get a 24 hour urine histamine too, but the lab ended up not running it. We did rule out carcinoid with a 24 hour urine. Uh, just repeated some basic labs that were normal. And I can pause there or I'll, I'll sort of just say what we're doing with him. I'm not sure it's working, but it'd be interesting to think, you know, what other things you might uh, think about in this patient and how you would treat him. But basically, given a couple of uh, case reports in the literature, um, so this I think is the best one, a 48-year-old gentleman who has had a story similar to this, recurrent, rather severe idiopathic anaphylaxis. 
he had a very high IG, notably, but he had been at the time of this report on uh, homolizumab for a year with no subsequent reactions. Another one, which is a 14-year-old uh, young girl with her current anaphylaxis, although in this paper they, they point out she may have mastocytosis. It was not fully worked up, but she's not been on uh, Zolaire for over a year doing well. And then another one in the dermatology literature who's required actually very high dose Zolaire, 375 every two weeks. When they dropped her down to 300, she continued to have episodes. And then, as mentioned, there's this trial ongoing at the NIH from which I haven't heard or seen any uh, preliminary data. Um, so with this guy, what we did is we discussed this. I suggested to him he should probably go to the NIH to actually be in the trial, though that necessitates a bone marrow biopsy, travel out there, and so forth. Or just empirically try omelizumab, and he opted for the latter. So we started him on August. He's had two doses so far. And I'm not in any way saying that this is working, but so far he's had no further episodes. Uh, so that's kind of where we stand with him. Um, what are the IgE values in the other two patients? I don't, you know, I, I just scanned those um, things again on Sunday. I didn't see them reported. Uh, I don't know if they were checked. Um, so I don't know, you know, if it necessitates having high IgE. I guess that's something that'll probably come out of the NIH report. Uh, but only the first one was it prominently displayed in the paper. So how do you, how do you determine the dose and the frequency of homolizumab? Uh, I have no idea. What I've done is do the same as what the chronic urticaria literature has shown and just treat as 300 every um, four weeks. Uh, this I don't know why these dermatologists started her on a higher dose. I think it may actually, maybe she had an IG level, although that's not a standard dose, right? I, what dose did they give her? 375 every two weeks. Isn't it normally 300 every yeah, two weeks? Yeah, chronic urticaria dose. Oh, but some people have said 150, but 300 once a month seems to be the norm. For, for asthma, though, is 375 every two weeks. So it's based on body weight and IgE, yeah, so you can get that's, 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 that's a higher dose. dose. They started her on that maybe just because they wanted to give her the highest dose. Uh, and they backed her down to 300 every four weeks, and it didn't work uh, at that dose. So, Mike, do you know what this patient has? <laughs> would you would you work up anything else? Would you get any other labs? Uh, would you get a bone marrow biopsy? Um, no. I, I, well, so we, we see patients like this um, not frequently. They're, they're uh, half a dozen a year, something like that. So, um, and I, I did the same things you're doing. Uh, Look for allergies. Look for anything that, that might cause it. Uh, get IgE. All the stuff you did. Uh, the baseline two nanogram and post reaction nine nanograms would suggest that it is that collapses. Yeah. I mean the data on that. I gave you the, the uh, that makes your likelihood of making the diagnosis accurately much greater, like seventy five to eighty percent likelihood that you're making the right diagnosis. Um, I'll give you our experience. So we, um, I have not yet put anybody on Zolder. I mean, we will. I mean, if I get if, if people fail, what I have them doing, I will go to uh, Zolder. But um, right now we have we had uh, we have uh, I think six patients with or six or eight patients with urticaria on Zolder. We were part of the trial, both trials with the Zolder um, uh, urticaria, and uh, it was pretty clear that Zoller worked. Uh, and uh, we have a, we've been able to get permission. David, you got two or three people, didn't you? And Mark's got about a half a dozen people. Or more than that, about the same as Mark. So maybe a dozen people on Zoller for, uh, and I have, uh, I only have uh, three. Um, and they're, they've all done well. Actually, it's been extraordinarily useful for urticaria. For urticaria, so you yeah. think it would work here too. We, we've put a lot of people on it for urticaria as well. We've had relatively little problem getting it, I would say, Drew would disagree with We that. still have problems, since yeah, Maverick yeah. is getting harder. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the trend is against it. It does so, seem to work well, yeah. So let me, let me share with you what, um, uh, that the, in, before I go to Zolaire, I decided to go back to an old thing, um, and that was ketodipin. Um, so you know that ketodipin's been available as eye drops. Yeah. And um, let me give you the background on this. So ketodipin, 
uh, was made by Sandoz, Novartis, that became Novartis. And uh, it's a worldwide product, it's a big product, um, and it's used for asthma. And they brought it to the United States in the mid 80s, and I advised them during that period of time. And um, the, uh, the product worked very well uh, in their clinical trials, but the FDA insisted that it be labeled as an antihistamine and not as a mast cell stabilizer. And uh, Sandoz made the decision to give up the American market rather than get me labeled as an antihistamine. They wanted mast cell stabilized. We did, while, while Bill was at the NIH, we, we actually did a few experiments, actually uh, Paul more than Bill. Um, we did a few patients um, on Ketodipine and it was very impressive. But then I just stopped using it for a while and tried other things uh, for about a, a decade. And so we had these girl, this uh, lady that came in and she was anaphylaxing every three or four or five weeks with severe ep uh, emergency requiring epinephrine administrating anaphylaxis. And I put her on ketonophen, and she's now gone over a year without an attack. And I put a dozen people on since then, and I'm having really good results with two milligrams of ketonophen twice a day. You get it. We, we can get it from Canada. That's right. You can get it from Canada. It turns out that it's easier to get it in England. And so we have a a system that's a pharmacy in England that sends it to us. And it's about one third the price of the uh, can. Yeah. That's right. I use two milligrams twice a day. And it costs um, $28 for 60 pills. One milligram pill. At one point, we got it as compassionate use. That's right. We were getting it as compassionate. They're not doing that anymore. That was a while back. But yeah, Congress got that. So if we, you'll tell us the pharmacy if we want to try. Yes, I can email it to you. I, I, I have it. Um, I just sent it to a patient yesterday. Uh, so I have it right on my computer, but I don't remember it. Is it sedating at that dose? Uh, somewhat, but not, not terrible. What do we have? We, remember I mentioned this young girl who's an anesthesiology resident who's anaphylaxing? And she's been anaphylaxing for years. But she just changed. She's a children's hospital. She just changed jobs with all the stuff, you know, moving to Washington, new job, all the pressure. She's really terrible right now. I have put her on like a um, and um, she's been on it three weeks and it's done three. And it's the first three weeks in a year and a half where she has never reaction. Just by itself? Or you can no, it's it? all with H1, H2, and Singulet. So, so then one, once I get them on con under control, then I stop the H1 because Katadafen's in H1. Um, and, uh, but uh, in the beginning, it's, it's uh, some H1, Zantac, and Singulet. And so, not, I'm not saying anything about Zoller. Zoller may be a better way to treat. But we've had a very good experience with Katadafen recently. And uh, I, as I say, I've got probably close to a dozen people on it now. And I'm going to continue. I'm, in, I'm, I'm not going past that unless I have to. And it's only a step for me now to try that in Ricari. I haven't done it with Ricari, but I will. In my mind, idiopathic anaphylaxis and Ricari are two ends of the same spectrum. Urticaria is anaphylaxis in the skin. You, know, you look, you don't know why it produces urticaria. Something's greater than their mouth, so it's in the skin. And the difference between anaphylaxis and urticaria is you're getting systemic mediated release. I think it's the same disease. Um, so what works with one should work in the other. Well, I'll be, I will be doing solar, I mean, ketodipin uh, and urticaria starting soon, because I'd rather do that than like a sporn. I just don't. Uh, is there any evidence if, if they're uh, in the same spectrum, it's like those more in those sorts of drugs for uh, recurrent black those effects? Haven't tried it, but um, certainly cyclosporin has been very impressive in our, in our terrible recurrent patients. I mean, we used to do, <laughs> we all did this, we all had this sort of regimen, we would go H1, H2, singular, doxepin, hydroxyzine, periactin, you know, you name it. We would try all these, jug all these products, and sometimes they worked. That was the amazing thing. So you, you'd add periactin, and somehow or other the patients got better, or they were going to get better anyway. Um, so now we're going through cyclosporin, and, you know, Plaquenil, uh, which I, I don't like to use, Dapso. But thank goodness for Zolak. Do you know what the story is with this NIH study? How far along they are? Well, they're, uh, it's a hard study there. They're being very resistant. They're very, very selective about who they're taking in. So we sent them three patients, and they rejected all. Well, they accepted one patient who rejected them because she didn't want to be 
they're doing bone marrow biopsies. The NIH is so careful to three-day hospitalization for the bone marrow biopsy. Yeah, it's a you know, patients didn't want to do that. It's an ICU. That, that's why he didn't want to go. I, I didn't know it was three days, but I told him he was going to need a bone. It's an ICU three-day visit. You know yeah. what dosing regimen they're using for that stuff? 300. 300. Monthly? Yeah. Now, I've seen, I had the chance to review the um, early carrier data, and it's really impressive. So they had, um, of the patients on Zolaire, uh, about 75% of the patients had a dramatic reduction. I think it was like 60% with complete reduction, complete eradication of their and they, and they started within a week and then lasted about six or seven weeks after the last injection. And so, you're talking data beyond the published New England Journal article? Yeah, I, 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 I got a chance to look at the FDA submission. Oh, the submission for approval. Yeah. So what what's the timeline for that? Uh, hopefully uh, spring of next year, with any luck. They don't know what the FDA is going to say, but the data is really great. No serious adverse reactions. Now, we, uh, on a related subject, do you see adverse reactions to Zolaire? Do you think there's anything to this anaphylactoid business? Well, I talked to um, the, one of the patients and one of the physicians, and it sounded like real anaphylaxis in one case, but they've only had like three reactions. It's three or four. There hasn't been many reactions. The ones that Phil Lieberman reviewed, there were relatively few uh, scary reactions, but there were a few. We've never seen any. Uh, no, that's not true. Um, well, so we do a two-hour first two admissions uh, administration, and then one hour for the next eight. So we do 10 administrations with a prolonged wait in the office. I have one lady who has, uh, she's my worst asthmatic, and I gave her Zolaire and within three days, she developed arthritis, had to be hospitalized with acute arthritis. And they've had a few cases of that. That's in the FDA submission, actually. Um, so they had, there's a small incidence of, of arthropathies. This lady had to be hospitalized, was in the hospital with high dose steroids for about four weeks, about three weeks. And uh, so then I waited six months and gave her another Zolaire administra administration. I cut the dose in half to make sure just to cover myself. She had acute arthritis again. So there's there are, that's uh, that I've seen. That's the only adverse reaction I've seen. Did they think it was like a serum sickness? Or? It occurred. It, it didn't occur right away. It was about three days. Later. There was she an atopic patient. There was not there. Characteristic right. skin rash or no skin rash. She had a knee and hips. Couldn't move. Did they? But she's a she's an incredibly bad asthmatic who uh, will be completely well, and then when she gets bad, usually with a cold or some exposures to an irritant, she'll get sick for six months, and I have to put her on high-dose um, steroids for, for up to six months. Nicole Brown, I don't know if you ever got a chance to see her. David got a chance to see most of our sick people, because uh, we dropped them, we dumped them all. Did you check any compliments, see if she had any compliment activation? No, I couldn't find any immunologic abnormality. And I don't know what's going on, why her asthma is so bad. I, 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 she's definitely a perplexing patient. I was hoping that Zoller would have been the right thing to put her on. Um, Do you want to, uh, let's say this is a woman, any comments on progesterone hypersensitivity? You've done some work there, and I'm sure you had a patient you were talking about. Did you, anything about that patient? It was a cyclic urticaria patient. At the same time every month, she would get urticaria for about five days. Is there a protocol you do skin tests these people? Well, I can tell you what we did. It was never worked up great. Um, and um, what, what we did is we gave progesterone in oil as a provocation. So, you know, progesterone comes in an oil, peanut oil, I think it is. And um, you give a milligram or two milligrams subcutaneously, the smallest amount you can give um, uh, subcutaneously. And it gets absorbed, and if they're progesterone sensitive, um, some of them had uh, mild to moderate anaphylaxis within two hours. So it was a provocational study. Um, you can't get progesterone in a skin testing form. It all comes in oil. Um, 
And the, the data was never convincing that you're reacting to progesterone. It was a change in progesterone levels uh, that se seemed to be the trigger. I don't, I, I'm not sure. I don't know what it is. Uh, I, I don't think it's IgE enzyme anything. I think it's that premenstrually they're having fluxes in, in uh, progesterone, and that has a vascular instability in some way. Um, having said that, it's a real disease. Catamenial anaphylaxis is a real disease. Over the years, uh, I've seen probably uh, 20 or 30 cases. We've treated uh, patients with uh, Luprod and with oophorectomy, and both Luprod and oophorectomy cure the patients. Um, and so that's your options. If you have a, uh, one of our guys we're talking about, a uh, uh, guy who trained with us, Jordan Rayfield, called me, uh, emailed me just this week, and he's got a 20-something-year-old, doesn't want Lupron, and doesn't want oophorectomy because she wants to have children, and still having recurring anaphylaxis every month. And um, uh, he has one who is maintaining on unopposed estrogen, which is what I'm doing now uh, for treatment. I, I put patients on unopposed estrogen, um, no progesterone, and I never, I don't have a, they never have a period. Um, and uh, this lady has a history of heart disease and breast cancer in the family, and uh, does, that's not an option. And so, uh, what to do? And I don't have an answer for it. Me and I are going to meet next week. I don't know what to do. But it's a real disease. Uh, Lupron um, is a fascinating uh, uh, treatment. And so, Lupron, what it does is it uh, it stops the uh, pituitary gland from uh, secreting. And um, during the first two weeks, you have an increased risk of anaphylaxis in these patients as their, uh, as their hormone levels um, diminish. And then uh, they go um, to, to a basically a pre-pubertal state and have no female hormones. And they stop menstruating. And their, their disease goes away. And oophorectomy, quite the opposite way of doing it, but oophorectomy works as well. Postmenopausal, most of these patients get better once their female hormones um, stabilize. But it's, it's a real disease, and I can't explain it. Uh, it's a fascinating disease. But I, I think it's not IG mediated. I think it's uh, mediated. And although the lady, the prototype lady that we saw, was exquisitely allergic of the first lady we recognized. So I'll give you the story. It's a fascinating story. She came in from the south, referred to the NIH because of anaphylaxis, and we didn't have a clue as to what was going on. She got pregnant. We had a horrible pregnancy uh, with anaphylaxis all the way through the pregnancy. She started nursing, and as soon as she started nursing, her anaphylaxis died. That told us that what was going on was um, when, when, you know, when you're nursing, female hormones um, stabilize. That put us into the female hormone um, uh, idea, and uh, so we then uh, experimented with different female hormones, provoked her with, with progesterone, and she anaphylaxed. And uh, so we then um, stabilized her hormones with Lupron. We did a clinical trial with Lupron with other patients and showed that that it worked, that the, their anaphylaxis disappeared while they were Lupron. We did a double blind crossover trial of Lupron and, and uh, some placebo. And um, that's where we left it. Uh, so that, that was my whole contribution. That's a long time ago. It's in the mid 80s or late 80s that we did the experiment. Jay Slater did. Um, and, um, but I still see about one or two cases a year. So it's a real disease. Uh, and uh, the only treatments I have for it are glucon and oophorectomy and unopposed estrogen. <laughs> Not birth control. Yeah, if it's a fluctuation of progesterone that, that causes it, then would combination pills that maintain a constant level of hormones not work? If you use them, if you didn't take a break, the real problem is having you know, they, all the pills are designed to let you have a period, so they all they all have a five day break. So unopposed estrogen you could do, but then you have a risk of breast cancer. I have those new packs now that are monophasic. You can just skip slowly. Well, you can just keep them on. So I don't keep up with the female. <laughs> <laughs> I, think so. I don't know about um, And so there, maybe there's another option. And then there's the rings that are that are yeah, hormonally yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, coded. Mm -hmm. But those are progesterone only. Mm -hmm. Is it like the seasoning? Seasonal. Yeah, seasonal. 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 Season
So it's, but it is, I think it's a progesterone mediated disease, but not IgE anti progesterone. It's progesterone levels of that change. Is there any value with fresh food testing that you're talking about you know, in this particular case? Because several of the cases seem like after food. Yeah, but you've got the two episodes. Easy to eat back. Everybody eats all the time. So you, there's, there's, there's always a story such as eating. But in general, the question about fresh foods as opposed to commercial ones uh, is definitely necessary. The reagents that we use that you know, we buy commercial food extracts are quite poor. So on the food, let me tell you a story. So we had this lady, very interesting lady, uh, and uh, she came and she said, I have not had any fruit in a decade, and I'm craving fruit. And she's burnt sensitive. Um, and so she has the oral allergy syndrome. She's a busy executive. She travels all the time. You know, you know this from the theater. She travels all the time. And um, I couldn't get her on immunotherapy. She, she just travels too much to take immunotherapy. So I, I've got her on birch oral immunotherapy. I started her about, um, like what are you using? Like birch? birch. Well, she's got two milliliters of birch and three milliliters of glycerin in a five milliliter bottle. I won't go through all the details, but the maintenance dose is three drops um, every day. And that works out to about 20 times the dose of immunotherapy you would give for birch. So the amount she's getting per month is about 20 times with immunotherapy. That's low compared to commercial products that are likely to come on the market. Well, if we get those commercial products, you know, then we will go a higher dose. But um, she had, uh, she gets, uh, when she takes the drop, she gets mouth itching and she gets anal itching. Um, and um, so I have her on antihistamines. And um, she's cautiously trying through, through about two months. And uh, so I think it's a great experiment. I'm thinking that, that uh, when, as we decide to do SLIP, first off, I know the guys who did all the SLIP work very, very well. and I. I'm not anticipating that American experience will be anything like the European experience. I don't think SLID will work anywhere near as well as it does in Europe uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, I think we're just more, I think we're going to look at the data more closely, select our patients better, and I don't think it'll work as well. But we don't have these monosensitized patients. Neither so. do they. They, yeah, just, they don't either. They no. just took the Those patients that come from Genoa to move to Washington have the same skin test positivity that all the people in Washington have. They're, mul they're multi-sensitized, just like all of our patients are. They just, whatever, that's part of the issues. Um, but I do anticipate that we'll end up using, and I really see a tremendous influx of patients to the office. When SLED gets approved, my anticipation is that 10 million Americans will come to our offices and see SLED. Some of them will go subcutaneous, some will go in SLED, some will go in proper treatment. But I'm anticipating next year or the following year a huge windfall for allergy. So it's a good time not to retire. <laughs> Do you think that it'll be approved for home administration in this country? No. Okay. Well, yeah, 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 you mean oral drops at home? Yes. yes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. The, I mean, the, the, what's going to get approved is the uh, the data for Merck's product. Is it Merck ladies? Okay. Um, Merck's product is pretty good. The Grass X. Grass X. Yeah, I think, and they. They've submitted grass X in February or March, and they submitted um, ragweed in May or June, and they're anticipating early next year approval. And the data's gonna get approved, I think. They, of course, the FDA, you never know for sure, but they had no serious adverse reactions. So, and they have a lot of patients, so. <coughs> so we're cautiously trying to slip there. We have five people on slip out of our office now, and they're very selective. Very careful slide. And I, I'm hoping that it works on this. Birch Lady is going to be the uh, prototype piece. I mean, how clear could it be? If she can eat an apple, she'll be happy. Win you win. Know, It'll be a win win. Yeah. And she doesn't have to bring hay fever anymore. She does. Well, she, she, I'm only giving her birch. And so, birch is important, but it's oak is our, our major strength. Right? In order to cover it, I have to give her oak. Anybody else? Uh, Thanks. Bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
first article is going in. Oh, okay. So soon. We're about to start. You're going to need a Seattle? Okay. I think we published this before. The slate is the Because she doesn't make it this soon. Okay, so we have this one. Okay, so we've heard about that.